All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week. This is episode 62, and uh, we do have quite a bit of stuff today. Not that many getting started or even articles and news, but we do have a ton of really cool announcements coming specifically from Google I.O. If you didn't know, uh, it was this week, and there is Quite a lot to be excited about, so let us get started. Uh, hey Tim, welcome to the stream. Hey Abhi, welcome to the stream as well. So let's start with the getting started section as usual. The first article we got here today is tips to use VS Code more efficiently and this one will help you to get acquainted with the VS Code if you are just getting started. The next article we got here is combination of React and D3JS, a pretty nice tutorial that will teach you how to use D3JS within your React components. So if you're just getting started with those ones, check this out. Next one we got is from Tim, who just joined the stream, by the way. Um, uh, the article is called How I Use Vue.js on GitHub Pages, and it's a pretty nice write-up uh, showing how you could set up your own Vue.js app on GitHub Pages. So if you are curious, do check this one out. Next article we got here is building a static blog using Nux.js and Markdown as a beginner. A very nice uh, write up on how to use Nux.js view and Markdown to build your own uh, very basic blog basically. Um, that was terrible, but there we go. So if you're looking to build your own blog and you want to do it with Vue.js and Nux.js, do check this one out. It's a pretty good write up. Next article we got here is introduction to React hooks. If you are just getting started with the latest version of React or migrating to it and still don't get the hooks, make sure to check this one out. The next article we got here is a guide to setting up Vim for JavaScript development. If you are one of those crazy people who want to use Vim for just about everything, then this one is a really good write up on how you can configure the Vim plugins to work with JavaScript. Um, yeah, if, if you if you are scared of Vim, that might not be the best place to start because it assumes you already know the Vim itself. All right, uh, next article we got here is building a React application using RxJS. A pretty simple tutorial on using RxJS within React app, so it doesn't really talk about, you know, what is, um, I guess, how can you apply RxJS? There's only one simple use case here, but it does demonstrate how to set all of that stuff up. So if you are curious, do check this one out. Uh, next article we got here is a guide to Node.js logging. Basically everything you ever wanted to know about logging in Node.js, starting from the console log and going to a different libraries and how to use them and what are the advantages and disadvantages. All of that is nicely summed up in this article. So if you are getting started with logging in Node.js, do check this one out. Next one we got here is persisting your React state in nine lines. A pretty nice introduction to uh, persisting your state, just as the title says, in React, specifically in a local storage using React hooks. It's a very nice uh, write-up that shows you quite quickly how do you use that. Um, can you shed some info on E18N? I came across this term into my... Uh, E18N is internationalization, right? So this is how you translate your app to a different languages. Uh, this is typically what it means. I, I'm not even sure why they concatenated to E18N, but the full, full world is internationalization, right? We are actually going to talk about that a bit later because there is some new announcement from Google I.O. on that front. So let us continue. The um, now we're coming to the articles and news and the first really big announcement of the week is from Microsoft actually. So there's been a Microsoft build conference and there's also quite a bunch of really cool stuff announced. So if you're curious about the whole Microsoft ecosystem, including, you know, .NET and stuff like this, definitely give it a look. But this specific article is called intelligence, productivity and collaboration from anywhere. Uh, this one is coming from the Visual Studio team and it talks about bringing Visual Studio uh, you know, uh, like the live collaboration again, uh, how do I, like, I'm terrible today. Let me just try this again. So this one talks about making visual studio available to everyone at any time. Right? So we already had a really cool things like visual studio live share or remote power dev tools that was introduced just a week ago or two weeks ago for the VS code. We talked about that in the previous podcast. So now VS Code um, and Visual Studio teams are taking a step further and actually turning uh, VS Code into a full-fledged browser IDE. So you will be able to just go into the web browser, enter an online environment URL and work with your VS Code right in your browser as if it was a local instance. 
which seems to me like, you know, I already said multiple times from all the releases and uh, announcements they made before, it seemed like a quite um, the end goal for them, essentially. And it makes a lot of sense. So for now, it is only the preview version. You cannot really um, just go and use it, but you can sign up for the private preview if you are interested. And it looks really good. So I am really curious to see how that will work. Um, uh, worth noting, they did mention that it's gonna be integrated with a GitHub. So all of that looks really exciting uh, for Microsoft and for GitHub. And I mean, I love VS Code, so that looks exciting to me as well. So there we go. Uh, next article we got here is open source collaborative text editors. A pretty nice write up that looks at to um, currently existing open source real time collaborative web based rich text editor. So it's a very specific field and a very specific set of editors. It goes through the uh, bunch, essentially listing a bunch of existing ones, then filtering them out based on a given uh, c categories, I guess, or criteria that author sets. And then the author has this Kiwi system that um, ranks the two editors that actually fits the requirements, being the CK Editor 5 and Atlas Kit Editor, which I've actually never heard about before this article, which looks quite nice. Uh, so if you are interested or you're working with uh, open source, real-time, collaborative, web-based, rich editors, this, again, very specific uh, niche, I guess, do check this one out. It does a very good job at explaining the difference between the two most uh, featureful ones. Like, I guess featureful. Wait, featureful. Uh, feature reach. Let's just put it this way: editors and um, yeah, ranking them using Kiwis to see how do they stack against each other and what kind of features do they have. So, if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Next article we got here is UX Showdown: Mutations versus Actions. Um, turns out uh, the UX is actually the next release will simplify uh, concepts by merging mutations and actions that was uh, announced by the uh, Evan Yu, who is the creator of UX, uh, on his recent talk, one of his recent talks, right? And the article here goes to sort of shed a bit more light and go in depth into what exactly mutations and actions are and why does it make sense to actually merge them into one conceptual thing and simplify things quite a bit when writing them. So if you're working with you and you're working with UX and maybe you are still a bit confused by mutations and actions, or maybe you wanted a deep dive and was not completely sure why are they getting merged, then this article will explain um, all of that stuff to you. Do have a look. All right, next thing we got here is building a JavaScript pedal gear boards. Let me just uh, allow frames here so we can actually see the thing. Um, now, if you never heard the pedal board term, it's it's what usually used in the music uh, when you have a bunch of uh, processing units, like small ones that usually do like one filtering feature, like the boosting or cutoff or I don't know, wah-wah pedals or whatever. There's like a ton of them. When you chain them together, you typically get a pedal board where you can plug in your guitar and then plug it in into the output and get some sort of a process signal, right? This is exactly what this tutorial does, but with JavaScript. So you can actually use your microphone to input a sound and then you will hear the process sound as an output. The pedal board itself has uh, six different effects, delay, tremolo, chorus, boost, reverb, and wah-wah. And the article goes into explanation of how exactly all of that works. There's also source code available. So if that sounds interesting, if you're working with sound or maybe wanted to work with sounds, then do check this one out. It is pretty good and a pretty fun project as well. Right. Um, next thing we got here is how to build a multiplayer.io style web game. This is a two part article uh, talking about .io style games, which uh, started, I think, by Agar IO that came out in 2015 which is essentially a massive multiplayer online game with uh, pretty relatively simple mechanics, right? And people playing through the browser. So it talks about browser building games with a real time multiplayer. And there's like a demo here, very basic one. Uh, obviously nobody plays it right now. So there's only like one player and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite nice. The write up is very detailed. As I said, it's a two part article. There's a lot of details on how do you actually build a game like this. Um, so yeah, if I guess if you're interested in, in game building and if you're interested in building specifically a multiplayer games, do check this one out. It will give you a pretty good introduction to making at least Agar.io style games. All right. 
Continuing, we got, I think that is actually it. Yes, that is it for the articles. And now we're going to the smaller sized things that are uh, kind of cool and awesome. So there we go. The first awesome tip we got here is uh, an article called Automate NPM Packages Security Fixes with Recurrent Tasks on CI. So it talks about uh, setting up the CI with NPM outdated and NPM audit commands uh, so that you can get notified whenever your dependencies go out of date or get some security vulnerabilities, which is a quite nice thing to have essentially. The CI tool used in this case specifically is a drone CI, which is open source self hosted, but I think it's also available as a service if you want to. But from the scripts they use essentially is not very hard to migrate this to just about any other CI system. So if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is the introduction to new Intel dot list format API, which is one of the new internationalization APIs, which is again, E18 N that has been recently added to the browsers. The list format allows you to format a list of things into nice human readable format in, uh, well, basically any language and also either using conjunction or disjunction, which is also kind of cool. So basically you just create this uh, list formatter using new Intel format class, specify the language and then a type as well as uh, optionally units like for example, feeds, inches, meters, and so on and so forth. And then you just give it an array of strings and it will automatically format them for you by saying, you know, hey, here's Frank or Christian, here's Frank, Christian or Flora. And it does it automatically, which absolutely is like before you would require a library for that. Now it's just integrated in the browser. So this is really cool. If you're working with internationalization, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is array from has a second argument. Uh, I guess a small reminder and a tip for people who didn't know that array from has a second argument that allows you to manipulate the values. So for example, one of the nice tricks is that you can create array from object that has a length property. This will create our, an array of length uh, with that property. So whatever you specify here, and then you can use a, uh, use a second um, argument, which is a function to specify just about any values that you want to be in that array. For example, here's um, a nice example that generates an array of random emojis. And obviously you can do a lot more with that. So if that sounds interesting and you want to learn more, do check this one out. All right, next thing we got here is the announcement from the Google team. So uh, the Google bot will now be evergreen and will use the latest stable Chromium rendering engine uh, basically from now on. So this was announced on Google IO, as I said previously, that just happened a week ago. And that means that all your websites are now going to be properly indexed and, you know, with JavaScript executed and everything with the support of the latest and best JavaScript and CSS features, which is kind of awesome because Prior to this, um, I believe it was very like severely outdated. I think the last version the um, Google bot used was like Chromium 64 or something. So that is quite a bump here. And they are essentially saying it's going to be evergreen. So that's that's just awesome. Continuing, we got another announcement from Google IO, the Google Chrome developers, uh, the um, sorry, Lighthouse team, the guys who created the Lighthouse in DevTools announced that they are going to be launching a light wallet feature that brings performance budget tracking into the Lighthouse. So you actually would be able to set up the performance budgets for your website and then track them using the Lighthouse. That could be extremely useful, for example, for CIs where you could run the Lighthouse through Puppeteer and, um, you know, if the budget fails, then you can just fail the CI task, right? Uh, that sounds really awesome. So I'm really looking forward to that releasing in the stable Chrome essentially. Next thing we got here is the new tweet from Dan Abramov. Uh, he found an approach that seems to work well for hot reloading hooks. And he has been working on it uh, in the past, I don't know, four or five days, I guess. There's been a lot of tweets on this topic from him. And this looks really exciting. If you never tried hot reloading with the hooks, well, it doesn't exactly work. So um, it's really cool that he actually found a way to make that work quite easily, essentially. It just works as expected, which is great. So there you go. Next thing we got here is the, again, new announcement from Google I.O. This time around, it's from the Chrome team. They are adding something called paint holding, uh, which is supposed to reduce the flash on white on the same origin navigations. 
there's a GIF that demonstrates it. Right now, if you navigate to a different page on the same domain, Chrome will flash the light screen, right? So you typically get like the white page, unless that's a progressive web app, which would actually navigate you properly. But normally you would just get a white flash and then navigate to a different page, right? So they are introducing paint holding. They will actually hold the current content until the first render of the loaded content in the background has been done and then swap them dynamically. So that actually looks like a progressive web app that you can, you know, when you switch the pages, they actually switch nicely without flashing, which seems quite nice. I mean, I can see how that could break some things or maybe feel a bit unresponsive if the network is slow. I'm not sure how they would deal with that. Like you need some indication that's actually loading, right? So I'm curious how that would work out, but that looks pretty good. Now, in conjunction with that, they've announced another API, which is uh, called Portals API, that uh, is fundamentally changing the way user transitions between web pages. So if you ever work with Android and know about the Android intents, how the intents works and how the navigation between the different Android application works, Portals is something very similar to that, but for the web. So uh, they have a demo here, a small video that shows how the person navigates from uh, between the four websites, starting from the meal plan, going to the recipes, going to the shop. And all of that happens quite seamlessly with a way to go back to the previous site. And it basically feels nearly native right now. So it seems like the Google is, is really set on making the web uh, feel as good as native apps and as nice and you know basically animated as nice as the native apps are doing that which honestly this looks dope i cannot wait for this to be shipped um i think portals is also like a proper spec so it's going to be shipping in all the browsers uh for now it's shipped in chrome canary behind an experimental flag because obviously you know it's a very um early preview but man this looks awesome i'm like this is really impressive and uh, I am very happy to see web progressing to this direction, basically. You know, this, at one point, I feel like we won't need any apps at all. We could just use browser, basically, which, which is kind of awesome. All right, continuing, we got another announcement from the Google I.O. This time around, it's uh, for the web.dev website. Uh, web.dev website, if you never used it, is a pretty nice website from Google that essentially helps you build better web apps. Uh, there's like a ton of things here, articles, tutorials, tools, uh, best practices, whatever the hell you imagine. And they just added a new section specifically for React. There's an entire collection of articles to help uh, developers build fast and performant React JS applications. And there's already like a seal of approval basically from the React dev team. They said that the articles are really good and uh, the content is high quality basically. So there you go. This is kind of awesome. All right, continuing, we got another announcement from Google I.O. The Google fonts will soon support setting font display via a new query parameter, which means you could say font display swap, which would mean that the fonts will only be um, applied, the Google fonts will only be applied once they are loaded. So you actually don't have this blank white screens anymore, which is great. So there's, there's great news. And yes, you now can do font loading without having to self host without all this bullshit. So there you go. Next thing we got here is a new addition to the react dev tools. Uh, the upcoming version will actually allow you to simulate suspending the components. You can just uh, select the component that you want and press the suspends button and you will get the component suspended state, which you know you can basically debug that it actually suspends correctly and everything and then unsuspend it if you want to. This looks absolutely dope. And I mean, <laughs> DevTools is just amazing. All right, continuing, we got an um, interesting trend from uh, Sam Secon uh, on Flutter. So Flutter is a new, you know, hype framework from Google. A lot of people are saying it's amazing and everything. And one of the, um, one of the so it's, it's multi-platform framework, right? It allows you to build apps for mobiles and for desktop and for web. So it actually can be compiled to the web. And uh, New York Times released a game called Can Can using Flutter for web, and you can like try it and see how it works. It, I mean, it looks and works quite nicely. Now, here's the thing. It has a one megabyte payload size. So uh, Sam here dived into this one megabyte to see what exactly was inside. If you are curious, um, there's a, I mean, it's not a super long thread, but it's, it's like a dozen of tweets. 
And it's quite interesting because majority of this megabyte is, is a runtime that is likely never even used in that game. There's also like a ton of very strange code in there that is like, and the full, for example, full debug logs in production build and IPv4 parser for some reason and stuff like this. So while Flutter might be an amazing framework for mobiles and desktop, it seems like there's still way to go for uh, web apps at least in terms of um, the resulting builds. But it's nonetheless, it's quite an interesting deep dive. So if you're curious, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is the announcement for from Preact team. They just landed Suspense and Lazy into the Preact JS Master. So that's supposedly coming out, I guess it's going to be part of Preact X, which is currently in beta. So if you are using Preact, that's really good news for you because you can now use Suspense and Lazy to dynamically load your components or will be able to use it in near future unless you are running off the master, which is sounds scary actually. All right, the next tweet we got here is from the um, sort of overview of the future of Next.js. Here's the three ongoing working proposals, I guess. Um, the first one basically would allow you to generate uh, API routes from pages slash API folders. You will no longer need actually any server or anything like that for serving this. There is another proposal for server middleware that is applied before get initial props that might be useful for quite some cases. And there is also native support for dynamic URLs without a custom server coming your way. So if you're using Next.js, do check this one out. It is quite exciting. Those look really good and I mean, I love Next.js. It's a really awesome framework and uh, seeing it expand in this way just makes total sense. All right, next thing we got here is a really big announcement that happened yesterday, I believe, uh, from GitHub. GitHub is launching their own package registry. So uh, it's not just JavaScript, it's not just NPM registry, but you actually get Docker, Maven, NuGet, and RubyGems registry all in one, all tied to your repository, which Honestly, sounds awesome, uh, especially, you know, there's been a lot of talks about the NPM issues with them firing people and doing some weird stuff. So having an alternative that is basically backed by a big player like Microsoft is awesome. And uh, there's, for example, the Yarn guys already working together with them to make it work, uh, I guess, even better. And uh, yes, for now, it's, it's in beta. You can sign up for the beta if you want. It's gonna be free and uh, you know available forever for open source packages as it tends to be with the GitHub. And I'm guessing there's gonna be same limits for the private repositories as you currently have. Uh, you know, basically depending on your plan, you're gonna have limited number of these registry entries available to you. But it's really awesome, uh, and I'm I'm kind of curious to see if I will be able to have the same. Uh, repository with both NPM and Docker registry because this is what I use for Exaframe, right? So we got an Exaframe NPM package, uh, sorry, Exaframe server NPM package that you can run manually. And then we got Exaframe server Docker image that is essentially the same, but packed into a Docker container. So we'll be curious to see how that will work. Uh, worth noting that right now you can use it. So again, if you are in beta, you can use it with NPM. So you the client, they are essentially completely copy the NPM uh, API, which means that it's fully compatible with NPM command line and it's fully compatible with Yarn. And the cool thing is that you can actually use it alongside NPM so you don't have to migrate completely to the registry. Because in um, GitHub, all the, in GitHub registry, all the packages are scoped. So you basically not, you won't be able to publish package calls, whatever, you know, like your package it's actually going to be at username slash your package. So it's sort of going to be scoped. And the thing is that NPM actually allows you scoped authentication. So when you do NPM login registry, NPM package GitHub com, you can specify minus minus scope and give the scope to the packages, which will be pulled specifically from the GitHub registry, which, which means that even now you can just use it alongside NPM and it will just work, which is kind of awesome. So quite excited to see where that goes. Again, if you are interested, do sign up for the beta and try it out and give them your feedback. That's always great. Like I, I just, can I just say that I love new GitHub and Microsoft, like after Microsoft bought it, they've been pushing out so many cool things lately that you cannot even, I, like before acquisition, I think they had like, it was exciting to see one update a year from them. And now we get all of this stuff within like half a year or something. This is great. 
All right. Um, yes, now we are coming to the releases section. The first major release of the week is Hyper 3, the Hyper Terminal from the side guys. Uh, it's the new version 3 with the blazing fast rendering, speedier startup times and emoji support if you ever needed that in your terminal. Um, there is a blog post describing what exactly changed. I mean, I'm using Hyper on Windows mostly. It works quite nicely. So um, they finally fixed that problem where if you uh, cut a very log file, very large log file, or try to read from the very long Docker stream, for example, of logs, your terminal will become basically unresponsive for quite some time um, because they didn't uh, batch the updates and the way that the, they communicated to the backend was... Well, inefficient essentially, right? So they changed that and now it is very snappy. And if you, even if you cut the very log, log file, very long log file, it will work nicely. So it finally works as a proper terminal. And uh, they also now migrated to the WebGL renderer, which makes it even snappier. And there's also like a bunch of, you know, minor, I mean, they sound like minor, but in reality, they're quite major performance tweaks. So it is, it is actually great. It is great, so do check this one out. Next release we got here is Preact X Beta 1, which is, I mean, it's they somehow managed to make it even smaller again with more features. I, I don't know why and how, but there you go. Um, no more focus workarounds, the security protection against vNode injections, use debug value and use imperative handle hooks, directly hydrate into DOM nodes and loads of compatibility fixes. So if you are using Preact, this is some exciting news for you. And uh, yeah, I guess just try the beta out, give them feedback and see if that works for you. It's like, I think in majority of my cases, I actually build using React because of the DevTools ecosystem and then just swap to Preact to get like a super tiny resulting bundle because come on, three kilobytes, you can't really beat that. Same API and just three kilobytes in size. Um, all right, the last release we got here is Node.js version 12.2, which updates some dependencies. And uh, I think there's nothing really super major happening in this release aside from uh, minor fixes, specifically to like modules and uh, adding some additional profiling flags. But yeah, uh, you know, if you're leaving on AH, make sure to update. Okay, that is it for the nodes and, uh, sorry, for, not for the node, for the <laughs> releases. Uh, now we're coming to the libraries and demos. Um, node have a tight schedule on release. I mean, they're always very fast with releasing the edge versions, right? So the LTS usually takes a bit more time because they have to make sure that it actually works and it's tested and everything, or not tested is a poor word because all of that is tested but that it, you know, there's no regressions and anything like that. While on the edge versions, they might just go ahead and ship whatever they have and not care much about having regressions in there because, well, it's an edge version, so caveat supply. But they do have an incredible schedule for releases, that is true. But okay, coming back to the libraries and demos. The first library we got here today is the OWL. Uh, enforce functional test development by earning something tangible from it. Um, an interesting idea, which I think doesn't really, what like, at least in my, in my head, in my sort of experience, something like this wouldn't really work that well. So the idea of library is that you can generate the documentation directly from your unit tests. While this is an interesting idea and you can certainly get decent docs from that, um, I can almost certainly tell that you almost never will have a good documentation unless you just take time to sit and write it because auto-generated docs can only get you there halfway and the other halfway is something that you have to do manually it, because you know it's, it's humans that's gonna be reading that and you have to put human effort to actually make it readable. But uh, nonetheless, the library is pretty interesting. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Maybe you start with this and then expand it uh, into a proper docs. Next thing we got here is snack bar, a tiny browser library for showing a brief message at the bottom of a screen, one kilobyte gzipped. Uh, looks quite nice like this. There's these bars, you know, and there's messages and everything. And uh, yeah, it's pretty simple API and there's like timeouts and custom actions and whatever. So looks quite nice. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Uh, next library we got here is React Formic UI. A um, <clears throat> Let me try that again. A set of form components uh, for React.js that is basically includes everything you need to do to, uh, to have 
to build nice React forms, um, including autocomplete, drop zone, uh, phone inputs, text areas, toggles, whatever. All, all of that is here. None of that, I just wanna note that none of that is actually styled, so you have to style it yourself, but it does provide you all the functionality that is needed for the forms, essentially. Next library we got here is Alicia. I guess that's how you read it. So I, maybe, uh, I, like, I don't know. So this is a library from Chinese developer and I'm, I'm assuming there is a correct way to read that, but I'm probably pronouncing it completely wrong. So I'm just gonna call it Lysia. This is very similar to Lorash, I guess, but way larger it seems. So it's a collection of over 300 micro modules for dealing with different problems in different areas. There is a pretty nice website that basically lists all of those modules. And the cool thing that all of those modules are, while the package is published as is, so it's, it's about 400 uh, kilobytes as a package, uh, you can actually import those methods separately. So as in, as in one file, you know, and it's gonna be tree shakeable and essentially your resulting bundle will be quite small. There's 339 modules that deal with just about everything. So for some reason, Lodash doesn't have some of those functions. You can try to find them here because, well, there is a lot of things to, to have a look at here, basically. Right, continuing, we got Fab, uh, let me try that again. Fabula, I guess, or Fabula. I'm not sure uh, what's the right way of reading that, but it's a minimalist server configuration and task management from the Nuxt team. It allows you, it's it's a Next.js, or sorry, Vue.js inspired um, configuration and I guess bash script preprocessor and runner that lets you run scripts either locally or on remote servers. That has a syntax that basically looks like Vue.js, which is, I don't know, to me it just feels a bit weird, but uh, maybe you will like that. So do check it out. It looks interesting at least. All right, next thing we got here is React Native Windows. Uh, now, there's been a lot of articles talking about the Microsoft launched React Native Windows. Again, they've announced this on MS Build, but it's actually been around for a couple of years now, I believe. And um, in reality, what they announced at MS Build was a new version that is called VNext, that is a full rewrite using C and C++, which is supposed to be like basic, uh, I think, yeah, okay, C++, just C++, no C, I guess. And it's supposed to be like better, faster and everything. So if you're curious, or maybe you never heard about React Native Windows, well, yes, you can actually use React Native to build Windows applications, native ones. And yes, it works quite well. Like it's, it's really easy to use. And uh, the next version is coming soon, which is supposed to be even better and faster. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Gridsum, a Vue.js powered modern website generator. Um, yeah, it's basically a website generator based on Vue.js, GraphQL, and all the other hypey things. Um, looks quite nice. And then, you know, comes with like pre-rendered HTML, single page app, progressive images, smart link prefetching, and a bunch of other features. Looks interesting. So, you know, if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Um, next thing we got here is Blueprint.js, a React-based UI toolkit for the web. A very nice looking uh, UI component toolkit. Uh, worth noting, they have a specific section about accessibility and they uh, say here that the accessibility is one of the goals of the project. So majority of components, they try to make all of them basically accessible. And uh, like, it's always great to see that, you know, there's not that many component libraries that have accessibility in mind. So if you're working with React and you wanted a pretty extensive actually uh, component library, then do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. It also seems like it supports themes because this site is built using Blueprint and actually allows you to switch the theming and, and all of that kind of stuff. So yes, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is TPJS, a simple tooltip library that is basically very small and dependency free based on pop popper JS. I guess this is the only dependency. So it's like the, another tiny JavaScript library that um, allows you to pop things. Again, it's about 10 kilobytes overall, I think. So, you know, not too terrible. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is cache, an absurdly small jQuery alternative for modern browsers. Now this is, uh, I guess you could call it more alternative to Zepto.js, which is no longer actually maintained if I remember correctly. 
and it's just five kilobytes min zipped and it seems to include almost everything from jQuery, which is kind of awesome. After leave stream early, thanks you very much for featuring my article. Well, thanks for writing it. I mean, that was a really good article. So thank you for uh, pointing it out to me. Again, if you if you write more stuff, do send it my way. I will be more than happy to cover them. All right, continuing, we got Node Recorder, a simple recording and replaying of HTTP requests, predictable development, uh, sorry, for predictable development and testing. So this is a um, module that allows you to tap into your server and record the request that you actually do. To then replay those requests in, for example, test environment and make sure that everything works as expected, which is actually a really cool idea. So if you're working with the uh, servers and don't want to write the send in request yourself, essentially, um, check this one out. It looks pretty nice. All right. Next thing we got here is the new module or I guess new ish module from Google Chrome Labs called Travis size report. And it's an additional tool for Travis that allows you to track the size changes in your resulting bundle which looks quite nice. So if you know, if you're working with um, size constraints and you want to track them via Travis, then do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Shaka player from Google team that shows off, I mean, it's, it's actually like a JavaScript player library essentially that supports dash and HLS and as well the EME, um, whatever that's media extent, media source extensions and encrypted media extensions, uh, web standards, but okay, there's DRM, right? Um, yeah, it's, it looks nice. Uh, the cool thing is that it has support for the all the modern features that browsers provide essentially like, you know, the media key um, in overriding and stuff like this, which I know some people already hate because I've seen a lot of topics discussing how do you turn that off in the latest Chrome, but <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so it's, it's a very full featured player framework. Uh, if you are working with the music or media on web, I guess, then do check this one out. I guess it has all the features you might ever want and it's built by Google. So it's probably quite good. All right, next thing we got here is ReaViz, a React.js data visualization library based on D3.js. It looks very slick. So they have the um, storybook here with all the components and there's like a ton of them and all of them look quite damn nice to be honest. So if you are working, why is it so dark? I don't see the actual component. Can I make it bright? I guess I can. I guess it reading my desktop theme, which is dark and it just goes like, okay, I will show you dark stuff, but it's not built for dark stuff. So, <laughs> Okay, but whatever. The components themselves seem to be quite nice. So if you're looking for a simpler way of doing D3.js in React for DataViz, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is the uh, couple of repositories from the Google IO. So the first one is progressive rendering framework samples. There is a progressive rendering Google IO talk that I would highly recommend watching if you're working with basically anything that has to do with progressive rendering, server side rendering, hydration and streaming SSR or whatever. Now this repo contains the demos for that, um, that show off the three techniques. The first one is progressive hydration. The second one is SSR and the third one is streaming SSR. Um, out of the context of the talk, it might be not as interesting, but once you watch the demos, it actually makes a lot of sense and is really, really cool. And the second uh, library we got here is view lazy hydration. It's also mentioned in the same talk, but talks about the same stuff essentially in Vue.js and this one allows you to lazily hydrate components on the page depending on conditions. So you can, for example, hydrate them when visible or hydrate them when idle or hydrate them on a user interaction, which is kind of awesome. So if you are working with you, check this out. This can uh, save you quite a lot of um, bytes basically on initial load. Next thing we got here is styled system a style prompt for rapid UI development. So it's a system uh, to extend your styled components with the properties um, that are sort of preset, I guess, by the styled system. So for example, there's an example of a box, all you can say is, okay, we need a styled div and we get the color from the styled system. And then once you use that box, you will be able to set color and background color, which is, I mean, that looks quite slick. 
So, you know, if you're working with stuff like this, do check it out. This looks quite nice. Next thing we got here is Node Convict from Mozilla, a feature full configuration management library for Node.js. So just as it says, it's a config management library that also provides a way to validate your config uh, with different levels of strictness and so on and so forth, define the schema and do stuff like this. Looks quite nice. So if you are working with the complex configuration files, do check this one out. It might help you quite a bit. The next thing we got here is VAS Micro Runtime from Intel. Now this tells you that WebAssembly is really lifting off. So this is, as it, the title says, a WebAssembly Micro Runtime built by Intel that they are using in embedded architectures, which is awesome. And uh, they are planning to bring um, a bunch of stuff like ahead of time compilation, for example. And it just looks really good. <laughs> Like the fact that Intel built their own WebAssembly micro runtime to run on embedded system is just mind blowing. So if you're interested, do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is Minecraft. You might be wondering why the hell do we have Minecraft here? Well, it's because the Minecraft team just ported the Minecraft Classic to browser and you can actually play Minecraft Classic, which is obviously a very old version that doesn't have quite a lot of things in your browser, but it, it actually allows you to, you know, navigate it, pop things and build things. And uh, it, it all works, it all JavaScript, which is kind of awesome. So, and you can even play it with a multiplayer of up to four people or eight people, I think, which is also quite impressive. So there you go. Right, uh, next thing we got here is, oh yeah, this crazy demo. Uh, the, I think this is actually the last demo of the day. Uh, so the, the the crazy person, Kevin Kuchta, I guess, um, builds a bidirectional CSS only async chat. Yes, it's, it's a chat that works using CSS only. Obviously it needs a server, but um, the client side is done using pure CSS, which is a bit insane. Uh, the server is done in Ruby if that stops you, but you know, just have a look at the client code, which is, <laughs> Freaking insane. That's the thing now, yes. Okay, that is actually it for the libraries and demos. Now we're coming to the uh, interesting and silly stuff. And there's a, two things that I wanna highlight today. The first one is the much assembly required game. This is an open source game that uh, sort of aims to teach you uh, 8086-like assembly. You basically have to program a microprocessor of a robot uh, that will navigate the game universe for you and do something in there. So if you ever wanted to learn an assembly but didn't know how to start, then do check this one out. It's actually quite cool. And the last thing we got here is um, NPM isn't all that great module. Uh, if you didn't know, NPM fixes the typos in, when you type install, for example, instead of install, if you type isn't all, right? So isn't all, it will still do install. Um, so somebody made a module that is that great. And if you type NPM isn't all that great, it actually works, which is a very stupid joke, but yeah, that thing exists. And there's 48 installs and there was 271 install for some reason, but there you go. That's basically all I have for today, guys. So if you have any questions, suggestions, or maybe articles I missed, feel free to send them into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap it up over here and go have, um, do something better than listening to me talking basically. Right, as usual, you can find all the links on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Uh, the VOD for this will be published on Twitch immediately after that and on YouTube just a tiny bit later, as well as on CastBox, iTunes and Dev2 again a bit later. Uh, you can find all the links uh, that I gather over the duration of the week, either on our Discord server or in a Telegram channel, all that is mentioned on BXJS Weekly Repo. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to reach out to me directly through whatever means you find. If you want to join our Discord server, I'll be more than happy to talk JavaScript with you. Yeah, seems like no questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Um, wish you a very nice and pleasant weekend or awesome rest of the week and I see you next time. Bye.